start off, Sean, by just talking um, a little bit about, or give us a bit of background context to today's lecture. What were your objectives for the lecture? What were you trying to achieve? Etc. Etc. And the nature of the class, really. That's right. Okay, so this was um, a class for first-year students uh, at the University of Nottingham. A group of uh, some 170 students, of whom 50 or so would be single honours or joint honours English majors, and of whom the remainder would be uh, people doing a subsidiary unit, uh, which is to say people from different schools, history, geography, maybe even uh, science schools, who are required in the first year to do a 10 credit unit, which is basically this one semester lecture course. Um, outside of their own schools. So it's a mixed um, uh, constituency of whom some will have uh, A-levels and, uh, and some will be looking further in the su subject, but some will have a very limited sense of literature and of elementary skills. So one deal is delivering to, to both those audiences at the same time. With the objective within the lecture being to model literary criticism to explain and historicise literary criticism to people who are starting out uh, in that discipline and also then to introduce information and knowledge and skills for the reading of the DH Lawrence short stories. The course itself is uh, an introduction to DH Lawrence's early work uh, studying Sons and Lovers uh, in the second half of the course. In the first half of the course we study the Prussian officer collection, Prussian officer and other stories uh, and we break those up into one or two short stories a week for the first half of the semester, which obviously makes it rather easier with, with a big cohort just arriving in the institution. They're bite-sized pieces of work. You can read a short story a week, follow up on some criticism, and be prepared for a lecture, which is a 90-minute discursive, ideally, lecture. One other thing about the definition of the lecture, I suppose, the outcome or the objective is to have an interactive lecture the lecture you've seen today involves me pretty much on my own. Um, in different parts of the schedule we'll have two people talking, myself and John Cray, John Worthen, Peter Preston and other Lawrence lecturers. Um, we also try to get a dialogue from the, the lecturer into the hall, so it's me talking to them and also them talking to each other. So in kind of different ways it's meant to be interactive. A uh, further angle to that would be the, the online area uh, of an interactive course website, which is really uh, the bit to develop, should we say, the bit that needs to come out of using the resources that we have in the archives here and making better use of our discussion boards and, and other kind of, uh, VLE environments. Thanks very much. Could you? Perhaps, um, if drilling down a little bit, could you actually evaluate yourself? How did you think against those objectives and aims that you had for today's lecture? How did you get on? Um, I would say that um, time-wise, uh, I was slightly off kilter in that I wanted to get to the textual comparisons in the lecture ten minutes earlier um, in spending so much time on the actual reading, which was reading of, of the story itself, drawing out the students' perspectives, which was interesting and I think did work reasonably well in terms of, of, of looking at the different ways of reading. Earlier on in the course they need to be modelling those and, and moving those into, into an appropriate language. That did overrun a little, which made the payoff of comparing the different textual variants something that was a little bit rushed in the version. So introducing textual criticism and then comparing it uh, I think could have could have done better with that. In terms of the discussions between the students, I, I was I was reasonably pleased with the way that um, that built up. Um, how do you, how do you judge whether a lecture is going well or whether those stages in the lecture are going well? Three ways. I mean, one is um, the, the the glaze factor, whether or not um, students' eyes are glazing over. One the a, a further one would be whether people are, are kind of paying attention, uh, whether people are ready to, to are following an argument and, and clearly want to, to respond to it. And when you, you kind of have an activity, whether they're cutting straight to it and can see what's going on. Um, also, you, you can tell yourself whether, whether you're just kind of making sense and whether you, you're keeping up with what you want to do and whether, you're, whether you've got the buzz, I suppose.
Do you um, with the questions? How do you choose them? Did you, for example, script those questions? Um, I think in terms of um, my relation to to a lecture now, uh, I have very little in terms of the script, uh, which makes it that much more um, dangerous, I suppose. Um, but it also means that there's a fluency to it, and you're trying to persuade. I feel that I try to imagine a lecture really as a conversation with 170 people, where. <laughs> You are trying to look at different people at a different time and to sense whether, as a collective, they're following what you're, a conversation with you, um, rather than just deliver information. You're trying to, to persuade and, and, and to model a certain kind of discourse. So, so lectures aren't just about transfer of facts? Lectures are very little to do with transfer of facts. Um, uh, I mean, I could easily have done a lecture which would have which would have given a chronology and a history, but it wouldn't have demonstrated anything of the significance of that. I could have told them the significance of the chronology and history, but that, again, they could have found that in a book anywhere. I could have put that up on a website. I could have distributed that. Um, what one wants to see them doing is starting from a basis of knowledge that they have, seeing the value and, indeed, the existence of that knowledge, that they do know things and that part of what the exercise is is articulating that knowledge and then trying to to frame that knowledge maybe in different ways to bring that knowledge into collision with, with other facts that, that involve an interpretation so I think a lot of what I'm trying to do in a lecture of that size and this is why the term interactive is there is that you're interacting really with, with the details of knowledge to try and create a critical or analytic perspective so does that mean that uh, it's the creation of the lecture, the development of the subject matter that you're going to cover, is a very organic thing? Uh, is that something that's like uh, what perhaps the shape of today's lecture was not uh, would not be the same as it was, say, it would have been two weeks ago yeah. had you not met the audience? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, I was. How do you organise subject matter? Yeah, no. I'd, uh, this week I'd benefited from the fact that last week had been the first session and they, they had some expectation of, of what was going to go on in the room and it, and it is entirely organic um, the best piece of advice I ever had about teaching was speak to the people in the room the only way you're going to know who's in the room is by talking to them and getting them to talk to you I mean which is asking them questions because there's nothing worse than being lectured at by somebody who hasn't respected the fact that you may know quite a lot about something already um, what you need to have uh, is recognition of, of what the students are bringing into the room so that you can then move from that towards kind of a, a further position or a, a modified or a more sophisticated or a more complex position. One of the things one wants to do really is to, to problematize uh, the position that they come into the room with and that was where today the problematization having established the understanding and that they have of the text and what the text is and what the meanings of the text are, then to say, okay, well, what does it mean that this text has four different versions? What does it mean that there are three different significant So you, you've already done the, some of this thinking. You've thought through, you've anticipated some mm -hmm. problems uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. How far beforehand do you start to, to make a kind of a mental map of probable directions? Maybe not necessarily as you see the script. Yeah, I think that comes out. I mean, the, the, the was a structure insofar as I had PowerPoint slides, so I knew the kind of five areas that I was looking at. It was kind of, have they read the text? Have they got the, the basic elements of a reading? Are they confident that their reading is apt and is valuable and is significant? Can they, and that wasn't so much what we were doing today, but that would come over the next couple of weeks, can they demonstrate from the evidence of close reading and pointing to the words on the page, can they demonstrate evidence for the reading if they're talking about, I don't know, the social documentary or the relationships as it was today? Can they can they go to the text and use evidence? Um, then it was to introduce the idea of the historical evolution of a text and then use that f really just to substantiate and augment the idea that they already have of the text that they've created just from reading the definitive or the final text. So those, those were there as goals and then in terms of, of the framing, um, I had 12 slides, the f 
first and the last were, were kind of title and bibliography, so that gave me tell, ten slides to deal with. Some of them have some, some information on them that would involve working through questions. What was interesting in looking at the basics, which is slide one, is that they did respond organically in the kind of order that, that those questions were there. It was I, I don't think I started turning to the slide until we were on to point two or point three, and I realized that, in fact, Oh, that's what we've done because that's what one does when one's doing a reading. And so, from the student perspective, what's great there is like, oh, we've done that already, and we didn't even notice we were doing something. So it must be okay to do that. So, what you're trying to establish is a kind of confidence and good practice, and then saying, okay, where does this go further? And already we were kind of 20 minutes into the lecture, and we were talking about some quite sophisticated aspects of of the text and the significance and the critical reading of the text, which was which was pleasing. Mm. Excellent. Um, is it part of your role to help students uh, with note taking? In this instance, no. I mean, that's something that um, that I would do as a tutor or in a different different pedagogical environment. Uh, I think that there's a limit in 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 this context with a group of 170 to what one can offer. There isn't a supporting seminar, for instance. Uh, it would be a very different uh, environment if you knew that you were then going to get groups of ten going away to talk about uh, this sort of stuff. And that would also be a reason for, for expanding the online environment if, if there were time and facility to do that. Given um, that you probably know all the arguments against lecturing, like the uh, paleo and pedagogic form based on outmoded transmission models, etc., etc., you still give lectures. What rationale do you reassure yourself with? Why do, why do I still give lectures is, 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 I guess, the question. And I think because it's it's dynamic, um, or it should be dynamic, it's where one gets the opportunity um, to disseminate economically um, both information and model skills. Um, and there is... There is there's a kind of right of passage is the wrong word, but there's a um, there's a social function to the lecture, which is bringing a bunch of people together, much as they might go to a, to a film or to an event. It's it's an event and a performance that that ought to to demonstrate in one area and form how exciting the subject is and and what it is that that's interesting and, and why might one might want to be a part of it. So. So there are functions over and above a kind of limited transmission monologue of power stuff, which I think on the evidence of today isn't what I'm trying to do anyway. Mm. Um, do you, uh, as a student, were you ever bored in lectures? Oh yeah. Why? Um, being given information that I could take from somewhere else, not being respected by the lecturer, not being given an opportunity to interact with the lecturer or my peers, um, not or, or on other occasions not be there being no acknowledgement that there might be difficulty in what's being transmitted. Above all, I think the thing that made lecturers lectures difficult was when lecturers would be talking about something about which I had no knowledge. Um, be that an author, be that a critical position, or whatever. So, so you go along to a lecture that wouldn't be connected to a course, and you wouldn't really know, or wouldn't have had time to prepare appropriately for it. I think not that one should go for a lowest common denominator, but it should be very clear every week what the lecturer is going to address, and where there is material that's that's being addressed that's over and above that, it become quite marginal. There should be a core that one can sit and feel a part of. I think there's there's a moment where it should be a collaboration and that I should feel, as a person going to a lecture, that I'm being drawn into something that's, that's sure, inherently interesting, but also that I've got some ownership of as well and that will want me, will, will make me want to, to engage further with the, the text or whatever it is. So it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's not dissimilar to a seminar environment, but it's, but it's different in the economy of it, in the collective of it, um, in, in the force of it. Mm -hmm. So if you had to give just three tips about lecturing to a new colleague, 
in, uh, in English, what would they be? Three tips. The, the first would be Peter Barry's tip to me, which is speak to the people in the room um, and find out who those people are. That may be the, whether that's two, I'm not sure. Um, the second is to, um, to trust the people in the room. Um, that, that, okay, you're always going to have some people that don't particularly want to be there, but, but if you're engaged and then you can communicate that engagement, then I think, for the most part, people want to engage with it too. They don't want to be there to be bored. Then. There's very few of them, I find, who it's just because they have to be there. Um, and the third is, um, <laughs> is something entirely different, which is just, um, it's not your fault which is a line from um, from that movie with uh, Matt Damon and Robin Williams, where he's a genius and um, oh, he's been a, no no he's a genius and he's been abused and Robin Williams is his psychiatrist um, and um, anyway and there's there's a point where I mean he's forever trying to prove things and, and there's this scene where Robin Williams finally breaks him down and says it's not your fault it's not your fault. Um, Students sometimes will not have done the preparation. They will have been out the night before. They will glaze over. They and your lecture will bomb. And it might be a lecture that you've worked really hard for. And in any other circumstances, it might have worked perfectly. But it's not your fault if it doesn't always work. If consistently your lectures bomb, then it probably is your fault. But um, but occasionally you're allowed to have lectures that don't come off. Great. I should really leave it there, but unfortunately I can eat it and I can cross eat it. <laughs> um, my next question is in, in terms of um, the importance of uh, the connections between what's being taught today and the greater course. Mm -hmm. How do you dovetail the lecture being given today with other lectures on the course or other activities or uh, exercises that the students want to do? How do you encourage is it important? Um, it's important at two levels. It's important at the level of the module, which is the rest of the lectures in this lecture series. And the coherence there is predicated on my presence, um, which is that I'll be talking with other people or I'll be lecturing. Uh, certainly I'll be there. And so you ensure that there's a reiteration and reinforcement of the messages of the course. Um, beyond that, it's a sense of knowing what the structures of of courses within the School of English are, and, and you just know that at level one, this is, these are the elements that we're trying to get over about what the discipline is and its historical and theoretical parameters, um, and that at another level, you're trying to move people onto that further level of, of then questioning those um, disciplines and parameters. So, so yeah, you, you're forever making gestures towards, well, this is what we're doing, this is what you might write about. This is another way of thinking about it. You could think about that further in terms of. I mean, today we suddenly had. I mean, gender politics was there. There's a sense that at some point they're going to talk about the sexual politics of representation, and, and that's a good theme to have them thinking. Ah, oh, there's an area here that's that's significant. It's in the text. I can explore that elsewhere. Uh, what about scaffolding the lecture itself in any way? I know that to the, the end. Of Today's lecture, you ask them to ensure that they do the reading for next week. Yeah. What else uh, do you do, or uh, have you done, or will you do? Yeah. Um, in the ideal world, there's um, there's an online environment that, that builds um, around the lecture to, to support it and, and direct people to further reading and to to asynchronic discussion. That's not there yet with this course for various technical reasons. Um, so, in terms of scaffolding. Do you like to? I mean, yeah, given the, in ideal, the ideal world, world would yeah. actually. Would and what sorts of things do you like to do then uh, before you, they come? You'd want structured think. discussions. You'd want maybe maybe quizzes just to kind of focus ideas, um, a bit of brainstorming those. Sort of things. But then you do want to, to allow them to explore it in whatever ways that that they can take ownership of the course themselves. Um, so what's always fun is to have a have an an anonymous discussion area where they can just do whatever they want to do. Because mm. it's always, I mean, that's part of getting to know the people in the room. It, it always surprises me who they are um, when you find out what they're up to. Uh, what about the impact of um, new technologies in, in the lecture theatre? Well, uh, two things. One is that I, mean, I find PowerPoint is helpful basically as a structuring device or a scaffolding device 
almost as a form. It's like a sonnet form. You can um, tell up a few slides and you know that that's a structure to work within and they give you your timing and they give you things to, to point to and, and structure. Uh, so that's helpful. What would be even more helpful would be the kind of dynamic model of textual relations that uh, the Learning and Teaching Support Network, English Subject Center, are trying to support with their D.H. Lawrence Audrey Chrysanthemum's project. <laughs> Well, thanks for that plug uh, <laughs> on your own project. Maybe we'll leave it there, unless I can think of this last thing about uh, yeah, um, reusing lectures. Uh, well, now I've got this one on video. video. I noticed in your <laughs> bookshelf you have uh, Alison Littlejohn's uh, book, Reusing Online Resources. We're very interested, I guess, in, in what is reusable and uh, do you? Reuse. Do you ever borrow from other people's lectures? Do you ever uh, write a lecture or structure a lecture such that it can be delivered again? I'm uh, a complete magpie of my own and other people's materials. There's, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of Rob Pope in that lecture today, for instance. Um, and the habits as a lecturer are all acquired from peer observation. If, if I were to go back to my three tips, I would say another tip is to see as many of your colleagues' lectures as, as possible. Because I'm, I'm sure we all lecture differently and have different ways. I mean, some people will be giving a lot more information than I was giving today. My focus is, at this stage, much more on modelling a, dis a discourse, if you like, and, and taking things from the students and saying, this is actually an important knowledge and this is how we might present it. So visual aids, today you used PowerPoint, you used uh, images, uh, would you be tempted to use video or yeah, um, other yeah. I, I was lecturing on McEwen last week and used clips from from the adaptation, which which really brought brought out questions of, of narrative position that were very significant in both the the novel and the film. So no no hesitation. And if I had a, a clip from the Audrey Chrysanthemum's film, I'd be using it. <laughs> Sean Matthews, thank you very much. Thank you.